my name is Catherine Nolan and I will be your flight attendant, facilitator, lecturer, whatever you like to call it, course coordinator for Fundamentals of Contract Law. Um, there could be up to 90 people on this particular Zoom meeting, actually a bit more. We've got, in theory, about 82 in the face-to-face -face class for contract, so it's going to be big. And there's about 12 of my darlings from OUA. And I know you're not supposed to have favourites, but I do. I like working with the online students, which is why I do a lot of online stuff for you face-to-face -face people as well. Um, not that I don't like working with face-to-face -face people. I probably shouldn't set myself up to fail, should I? But, um, yeah, I just think there's incredible bravery about doing something like a law degree online uh, and that difficulty with facilitate with, with connecting with other people and because those of you who are face to face if you don't connect with other people well it's not like you didn't have the opportunity to do it um, and I would strongly recommend that you do connect with other people through your law degree you will learn a lot more by talking to other people and working with them so my job today is um, I'm actually going to pull up a PowerPoint presentation now um, hopefully this will work. I need to put it there. Um, I am basically wanting to really just do some of the basic introductions so you know what to expect of the course, uh, where to look for things, and you get a sense of who I am and I get a sense of who you are. If you get bored or think that this, you could just go and work through the PowerPoint at any time, I will not be sad if you disappear. Um, you don't need to tell me, just disappear. That's fine. It's all going to be on the recording and it's going to be there. If you have questions as you go, um, sing out. Let's talk about them, okay? Um, so, yeah, firstly, actually, very first things first. Before we even begin, I would like to, on behalf of us all, acknowledge the traditional owners based on which we are coming together to learn today. Um, we are diffused today where I am. I'm actually in the northern suburbs of Melbourne. I'm standing on land that traditionally belonged to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I would pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and especially any of you amongst us who are Aboriginal or Torres, Island, Torres Strait Islander people. Um, I think that it is really important to make that acknowledgement at the beginning of a serious endeavour and particularly an endeavour that relates to the laws of Australia which are very, very new laws and many would say uh, are, are um, laws that perhaps we should not have. Now, that's a debate and a discussion for another day, uh, but I do think it is important to make that acknowledgement at the very beginning. So let me introduce myself to start off with. Um, so Catherine Nolan is my name. Unlike most of your other teachers, facilitators, I do not identify as an academic. Um, at, at best, I call myself a pracademic. Um, I have, um, on the 20th of December last year, I celebrated 30 years continuously holding the practice certificate. Um, I have been a legal practitioner for more than half of my life, a lot more than half of my life, actually. Uh, I started off in very large firms doing infrastructure type for a lot of natural resources, exploration type projects. Um, my actual interest has always been technology. Um, when I started at law firms, our clients did not communicate by email. In fact, law firms didn't communicate with each other by email. Uh, I actually chose the firm that I went to first, a, a firm that at the time was called Cause Pavey, Whiting and Byrne. It's now Cause Australian Solicitors um, because it had internal email. Uh, so I moved from an infrastructure type practice. Um, actually, as I practised in um, 
electricity for quite a long time. I was uh, involved in the first of the privatisations, first Gladstone power station in Queensland and then the Loy Yangs down in Victoria. I was based in Sydney initially. Um, I worked in technology for a while. I uh, then went and I was an investment banker for a small amount of time. I maintained my practice then because I was also involved in um, the deals committee and in compliance. Um, I then became a partner of a very small free partner firm uh, and I then actually escaped that and became a sole practitioner for a while. I then merged my practice in with a medium-sized partner uh, partnership as the first female partner in that firm's, at the time, 103-year history. Um, and then I basically continued working there until I ended up going in-house with a client. Uh, with that client, I took um, a project that we'd been working on together for a long time through an ASX listing uh, and then subsequently joined that company full-time uh, and I was on the board of that company and its UK subsidiaries. Uh, subsequently, long, long story short, I uh, and my business partner have built another company that uh, has also now been listed in the fintech space. Uh, while I was doing the second startup, I had no income and I have expensive tastes in books, computers, and shoes. So I basically somehow got talked into uh, running a subject for RMIT over a summer in 2012. I ran acquisitions, takeovers and mergers, which is very much my practice space. And um, I loved it and mostly they loved me, I think, except for the ones who hated me. They're pretty even. Uh, and I've been pretty much teaching at RMIT since in both the law and the business faculty. I have an MBA. But I got along the way and I teach in the MBA program as well. But I am not a researcher. I am not a PhD. Uh, I am not the person who knows absolutely everything about one thing. I know a lot of things about a lot of things. Um, but, you know, I am broad and shallow as opposed to deep. Uh, and I think that's one of the things I love about the RMIT is that you guys get exposed to all sorts of different kinds of teachers and open square brackets academics. Like I, I really don't, technically I'm an academic, otherwise I wouldn't be qualified to teach you, right? But I am not an academic in the ordinary sense. Um, you guys will complain about me for a lot of reasons. My guess is the depth of my research will not be one of them. Um, but, you know, everybody has a different approach to it. So I really came to this initially. I won't pretend, you know, I was earning no money doing a startup. I have expensive tasty shoes. I needed a job. But why I've kept doing it is because it's the profession has been fabulous to me. I have loved being a lawyer and I've had the reason for going on and on and on about who I am and what I do is really give you some insight about how many different things, how many different careers you can have with a law degree, how many different ways that you can use it. Um, and I'm just sat in the commercial sphere so far. Um, so I wanted to give something back to the profession and pretty much every graduate that I've ever worked with, including myself, sucked at the beginning. So anything I can do to make you guys suck a little less is my, my way of giving back. So I really, you'll find that I do very much approach this from a practitioner's point of view, that I'm much more interested in what you're going to be doing with these rules and these principles in practice than I am in the black letter law. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't do the black letter law. We have to. This is a fundamental subject. Um, actually, at risk of going off pissed yet again, um, I think this subject has the wrong name. Um, it is a fundamental subject. There are fundamental principles that you are learning in it, which will you will find are relevant to more than just contract law as you go forward. But it is really a subject about making contracts. In So there are two contract subjects. I think this one should be called starting contracts and the other one should be called ending contracts because that's ultimately what they're about. And in this subject, what we're going to learn about, it's going to peel back the layers. Um, it's like I sort of think about it as what I'm going to do is just spill all of these jigsaw pieces on a table 
and we're going to pick up and examine each of the jigsaw pieces one by one over the course of the semester and assemble them so that you can actually understand at a really fundamental level what it takes to make a contract um, as a matter of Australian law. But the whole time we're going to be thinking about, well, what do we learn from this? Because you probably already worked out, there'll be, I think, roughly 25% of you will have done intro last semester or earlier. Um, and then the rest of you are probably were at intro over the weekend. Uh, and so you'll, you're already, you're all aware now that one of the key ways we learn about what the law is, is by studying cases. Uh, the common law develops as cases come before it. But when you think about it, learning how to write a contract by studying cases is like learning how to have a good marriage by only speaking to divorced people, right? You know, we're looking at the 1% of the cases where people have a dispute that they cannot resolve. And even then, for them to have standing, then they have to be, the dispute has to be so bad, the relationship has to be so broken down that they can't resolve it after multiple appeals. Um, where if you are a lover as opposed to a fighter, if you want to be the kind of lawyer who puts contracts together and almost every kind of lawyer has to do that in some form or another, even the litigators need to do that when you're settling something, uh, then really what you're trying to do is create a relationship that's going to work. Actually, one of your KPIs is for this agreement not to go to court. So we're going to constantly be thinking about that. Um, I'm rabbiting on because I can't see my slides, but the slide here basically has some stuff about how to contact me. That should be pretty easy to find. Um, I think of it as like kind of an escalation. Think about how stressed you are. If you are super, 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 super stressed about something, pick up the phone and give me a call. I really don't mind. I won't pick up if I'm doing something. Like the phone just rang before. I don't pick it up, right? I don't even look at it until I'm free. So you're not going to interrupt me, but I will look at it and I will come back to you. Unless your name is already in my phone and if you ring me with your phone number, it will go in my phone so that I know who it is to call back. And unless it's already there, tell me who you are and that you read my contract will pass so that I know to get back to you uh, and I know what I'm talking to you about. Um, if you just need an answer relatively quickly but you can wait, try email. Um, Canvas has got an email se section in it. Um, they tend to only come to me once a day, but normal email, quite frankly, I only look at it about four times a day. So, again, I don't stop what I'm doing to look at email, but um, I do check it about four times a day and I'm pretty good at getting back to people. Uh, other ways that you can actually uh, try to ask questions too is to go into the discussion groups for each uh, section, for each topic, um, because it might be the act of actually phrasing out a question and sharing it with your colleagues that you will get an answer that way. I've also created the CAF bot. I think she comes up on a slide later. I'm a much better lecturer than I am a computer programmer, but I thought, hey, I can create a bot, surely everybody can. That's what all the middle-aged women are doing these days. Uh, so I have tried to put the CAS bot together with a range of things that are the sort of admin questions which often people are embarrassed to ask me about. Things like, what room are we in? Of course, they might change at any minute, so it's the last room I knew we were in. Uh, what room are we in? What's the reading for this week? Where do I find something? What's Iraq? Like the methodology for understanding cases, not the country. She can't tell you anything about the Middle East. Um, so try the cath bot as well. Uh, let's see. Ah, yes, here's my, I don't know why that is doing that. The cath bot, if you're really interested, you can QR code that. Clearly that slide isn't working. Um, oh, actually, why don't I quickly show you what the cath bot looks like just in case. Uh, is it? Yeah. This should help me. Okay. 
So when you go to the CAS bot, which is embedded in um, uh, Canvas, by the way, you can send me a message. Uh, the benefit here is if you want to tell me something anonymously, you know, like how much you hate me, how much you love me, how much the person sitting next to you smells, I don't know, the stuff that you don't actually want to share with the world, um, this is a good way to contact me anonymously. I cannot unless you tell me who it is without who has sent me any message. Uh, so basically, range of different things that you can do. Um, you can just play with it if you want to and it will, at the moment, I think I talk, it talks about football, tips and tricks, weather, tips and tricks. You can just go through. So see, have a go at it. I know um, Tina got ADG to put something together for torts as well. Really interested to see what you guys think and whether it's useful to you. So go with that. Let me... By the way, any questions, concerns, frustrations? Awesome. Uh, let me just, sorry, what am I doing here? I want to share that. Okay, so a little bit now about the best way to get yourself on top of this class and quite frankly any class. Um, there was some research that was done way back in 1933, any library nerds amongst us will remember Dewey of the Dewey Decimal System fame. Um, so the research that he did into learning and retention in particular uh, still holds true today, basically shows that the more actively you are engaged with anything that you do, the more likely you are to retain and make sense of things. So effectively... The more passive you are, the more you're just sitting here listening to me, the less you take in. And the more active you are, so, for example, talking, actually participating, talking to other people, trying to explain things, the more likely you are to maintain or uh, create, uh, sorry, hold on to the information. Um, so basically... In a nutshell, that means at any given time, I am learning more than you are. Um, but it also explains the ridiculous number of animations and bits and pieces that I have in my slides. Um, but also why it is that I want you to take the time where you can to really think about the questions, think about what it is that you're doing. And in the face-to-face -face classes, you'll find we flip it a lot. So as you work through um, Canvas, you'll see from most topics, there are these things called desk lectures. Now, I created the desk lectures particularly for, initially for my online cohort, because online students often find they're often short on time, and also students who don't get time to go to the lectures. And when you're talking to people, you can get really pulled out in quite a lengthy way because we're having the discussion backwards and forth. So what I try to do is create these desk lectures, which are really just really short, I'm not as short as they should be, but short explainers of the content, content and the readings so that you guys can come in completely prepared and we can do activities, have more Q&A in the classroom. Now, I still record all of that, but for online students in particular, if you've got questions that arise out of that that we need to talk about in class, you just need to contact me with those. Um, we also, I will do regular um, shoots like this one. They're specifically for the online students, but I'm very happy for face-to-face -face students to join in as well. They tend to be quite unstructured. Uh, the classes are a lot more structured than the tutors, but quite unstructured. Come in, what's your question? Let's have a conversation. Let's do some problem solving of that sort of thing together. So we've got a strange kind of class format this time. So we're kind of, we're on hold now until Saturday the 14th of March. Um, reasons for that are varied. One of them was I was supposed to be in Vietnam right now, but the coronavirus has put it into that. Um, but the main reason is we're experimenting with this. What happens is we've got all these students doing intro and you're exhausted and then you're trying to do the preparation for contract, which is always on a Monday night, before you've actually done intro and learned how to read a case or what a case even is. 
and you've done all of that prep and you've had this huge weekend intro and by Monday night everybody's exhausted and they're just like deer in the headlights. It's just all too much. Um, and then because of the public holidays in first semester, you have a break. So what we thought we'd do is just bundle up the three weeks into really like a mini intensive. So we'll do topics one, two and three properly over the Saturday and the Monday night which will give you a great launch into your very first assessment task. So it'll be very active to start off with. But, um, for online students, that means you're not going to see recordings of that material until uh, the, the first lot you'll probably see on the 15th, and then you'll see them on the 16th and 17th, depending on how quickly I can prepare them. So for those of you who are face-to-face -face students, a couple of things that are pretty important to me. Firstly is I will start on time. Um, if you can't get there, and 5.30 is an early start for those of you who are working in the city and rushing, if you're not there on time, don't think that because I've started on time it means that you shouldn't come. Just come in quietly, find a seat and catch up. I will not go backwards, but the recordings are there. And if it suits your learning style to be in the room, I would much rather you came in late than um, sort of thought you were going to disturb people. But just try not to disturb people when you're doing it. <coughs> Sorry, talking too much. Let's get back to my cup of tea. Um, participation. I showed you the research already. It's important. You need to do it. At the same time, everybody participates differently and you kind of have to bear with me. Um, I will shut people down. I might shut down people because they're being annoying. Um, I'm more likely to shut them down because we've got a timetable to get to through or I'm going to come around to something at a later point in time. It depends. With up to 80 of us in the room for a face-to-face -face class, not everybody's going to get a say, but you will get opportunities to talk to each other and we'll find some ways to try and make that conversation happen. Uh, we might even, I'm trying to think of some ways to experiment with maybe having a live chat in the room while we're doing the class so that you can, that you can get make sure that your questions get caught, if nothing else. Um, all of the lectures are recorded. So face-to-face -face students, you need to bear with me about that. Um, it does mean that I am likely to repeat your questions sometimes so that the recording makes sense to those who are listening later. You might find it annoying when you're in the room. You will be very grateful because you will miss a lecture and you'll be listening to speak to me. Um, but if you speak up, I might even have an extra microphone depending on how things work. We'll, we'll make that work. Uh, online students, um, just because you're not in the room doesn't mean that you can't participate in the discussion. So get on to the discussion boards. That's particularly important for you because it's harder to find your people in an online environment and I can't stress how important that is. You need to do the reading. Um, it is better for everyone if people come to class having done the reading and I am going to work on the basis that you have done it. Now, the reading is sometimes complex and unusual, particularly the older cases. Um, the language is not what you're used to reading and it might not make sense to you first go. That doesn't matter. The classes that are help you to consolidate that and make sense of it, um, there's a lot of reading. Don't get yourself caught up and stuck and just rereading the same thing, panicking. Read it. Make notes of what it is that's confusing you or what you don't understand and, you know, a note that is all of it will help you focus your attention as well. Take those notes with you to the class. Notice when we deal with the, the particular things that you've had trouble with. That will help you formulate the questions in class, whether you're physically in the class or you're listening to it. Um, and then if we don't answer them, ask the questions. Um, it might be many people find that they have to read first, then they come back to it after class, read again, and it all fits together. Most weeks I've built some little quizzes in um, which will help you work out whether you've understood the reading or not. Uh, they're not compulsory. You don't get a mark for them, but it will give you some feedback in an automated way as to whether you've understood and whether you're on track. 
Um, I've already talked about responding to emails. Um, please bring your phones to class. <laughs> please bring your phones to class. Have them on silent. Expect to use them. We'll do some quizzes, play games, things like that that use them. You need to take a call. It happens. We've got parents, we've got people with busy jobs, we've got everything. That's your call. You know what's most important to you in the moment. But just if you can have it on silent, get up and go out, come back in as quickly as you can. Or if you have to leave, you have to leave. Check back in with me and I'll make sure that we keep you on top of things. Um, many people ask, do I need to bring the textbooks? Do I need to bring my computer? Um, bring them if they make you feel comfortable, but you don't need them. My strong preference is, that, and this is based entirely on the science that says how you retain information, that you should try and take notes in a handwritten way. A couple of reasons for that. One is it's active, you retain it. There is something that happens between your brain and handwriting that helps you maintain that information uh, in a way that doesn't, particularly if you can touch type. Uh, but secondly, um, you are going to have to do a two-hour exam for each of your Grizzly 11 subjects. So many of you will not be used to writing that much. It's actually also physical muscle training that it is helpful for you. Um, also, you get to work out whether your handwriting is legible or not and do something about it before I have to read it in the exam. Um, I will give you slides in advance. I do tend to do my preparation of the day and sometimes I change them, particularly if they're in new places. I don't have in press law. So they might be slightly different from what I've given you. As soon as I've updated them, I'll update them in Canvas as well. Some of you will want to print them all out in advance. Makes me sad. But if that's what you want to do, just know that the slides of the class might be slightly different. I also reserve the right to do them in a slightly different order or move things around depending on how the conversation goes, what's working, what's not working, how the class moves. I think of the slides as something for me to remind me of what it is that we're doing. Um, anything else? Any of you think of anything? I'll put you on notice because it means to do it here. But if any of you have been in a class that's worked really well, particularly a large class, and for law, 80 people is a large class of face-to-face, -face, if there was something that somebody did that made it work, if you can share that with the rest of it, um, us, I'd really appreciate it. Uh, and a little bit of social media there. I tend to tweet... Um, a lot about lots of things, um, but when I think it's relevant to contract law, I use at RMIT SCL under the contract law hashtag. Um, and yeah, feel free to follow me on social media and um, bag me if you need to. Uh, quickly for face to face classes, relevant for OUA, in this is how you should expect the recordings to be broken up. Um, recordings are much, much longer than the desk recordings. Um, they will probably go for anywhere between three quarters of an hour to an hour and a half. Um, I will give you both video so you can see the slides in action and hear my dulcet tones. Um, I will also upload an audio only version for those of you who want to stick me in your ears in public transport, um, as you walk in the park, as you ride your bike, whatever it is that you do with me in your ears, um, I don't really want to know. Um, feel free to put me on chipmunk speed. My voice is already annoying, so it's only going to get more annoying fast. Go backwards and forth. Do it how you it works for you. Um, I will endeavour to do the recordings within 48 hours. Pretty much somebody has to be bleeding from the eyes in my household before it takes me that long. But they do take, the videos do take a bit of time to process. So I get them up as quickly as I can. But don't panic unless it gets to the 48-hour stage. Um, the next thing, I'll send a survey around after I've done this. Um, you can find the survey with your phone with that QR code. Um, I'm looking for a time that will suit many of you for doing a tutorial um, on a regular basis. I think of them as drop-in tutorials. Um, they're pretty unstructured. I'll answer questions. 
um, I usually have a quiz or a game to play if nothing, nobody's got anything that they want to do. I record them if this one's definitely being recorded, but those of you who are recording. Um, but I only record the tutorials if there are three or more students in them. And the reason for that is less than three, you know, when there's only four of us, it's a cup of tea and a chat. And I think people tend to give away more about what's worrying them or, uh, you know, where their personal questions are as opposed to questions that would suit everybody. And if, if you're good enough to come to a tutorial and nobody else wants to come, you just be able to do that without a recording, I say. Um, but otherwise, if we've got four or more students, so five of us in the room or more, then I record them and they're available. Next thing that I think is always worth doing is spending a little bit of time planning your semester. The stuff that's on the slide is clearly not actually your canvas shell, it's from the previous one. Um, one of the most beneficial things I think is the calendar area in Canvas. It, and, that, and you can actually, if you use Outlook or Google Mail or Google Calendar or pretty much any online calendar program, you can make sure that your Canvas calendar, which has all of your deliverables and due dates in it, is also linked to your uh, your standard calendar so you can see where things are. Now, not every facilitator will go to the trouble of actually blocking out. Now, I actually put the times that your lectures are on, including for the OUA students, just in case you want to come to class or just in case you're wondering when it's actually recorded. Um, but I, I've, got, I've got pretty much everything in there, including a whole truckload of stuff that is not assessed. Um, so there are things that you might want to do by a certain time. So, for example, quizzes are often in there. And I also do from weeks 2 through till 10 or 11, with the exception of a week when there's an assignment due, um, I, there is a discussion board task that's available for all of you. Um, and that is a problem. So it's a problem that's relevant to what we're studying at that time. That gives you an opportunity to just have a go at answering a problem task. If you do it, you will see the responses of anybody else in your cohort who did it too, and they will be able to see yours. Unless you actually have a go at an at doing an answer, you don't see what anybody else does. I will also give you feedback on those. Um, as if I were marking them. So you will get a score as if they were being marked, probably not at the level of detail when it really counts, but to just give you some tips and tricks. So a lot of students find them really useful and I can't give you any actual data, but I can see a correlation between students who do them and exam results. Um, because legal writing is new to you, Interacting with the technology is new to you. There are a whole lot of benefits to doing it. Now, some students will say, I've got enough reading to do. This is like something extra. Depending on how you study and what works for you, fine. I don't mind less work for me. It's all awesome. Um, but I do, I really stand by that idea that the more active you are, the more you actually put pen to paper and commit to what you think the answer should be, the more likely you are to actually be able to make sense of this So think about blocking out some time to do those and they will show up in your calendar as two uh, to give you a little bit of um, impetus. If that annoys you, just click on the little button to make them go away. Any questions, concerns, frustrations, thoughts about that? Just to unmute yourself and yell out if you need to interrupt me as I go. Uh, so one of the things everybody wants to talk about really early on is assessment. Um, this is all done by due date. What I'm going to do is release after we have our third class, so our second class, once we finish all week three, I will release our first problem. I haven't released it yet because I actually want you to listen to everything up until that point, not just try and answer question. Darren, do you have your hand up? I haven't seen that tech before. That's exciting. Can I unmute your, your 
you got a question or something for me? Oh, you're lowering it. Oh, it was so exciting to see it pop up. I've never seen anyone do that. Um, anyway, nice to meet you, Darren. Um, your first uh, task is going to be to answer a legal problem. Uh, so basically you are going to imagine that you are a junior lawyer working for um, you are imagining that you are a junior lawyer that who works for Dennis Denuto. Um, if you need something to do between now and then, watch the castle. Um, I love Dennis Denuto because he's exactly the sort of lawyer that I worked for when I was a baby lawyer. Um, basically pretty much incompetent. So you needed to be really 100% sure that you were getting it right when you did something for Dennis to sign off on. And I think that's what you need to do here. Sorry, I'm just calling my old boss Dennis because I'm defaming him otherwise I'm pretty sure he's still alive. Uh, so you'll be writing a memo. I will give you feedback on how to write a memo. Concentrate on working out the problem first. Um, so the next thing that you will be doing will be due at the end of week nine. This time you're actually going to write a letter to the client. Again, it will be a problem-solving task. And then... Um, oh, okay, I haven't fixed my slide, Lordy girl. Um, ignore the bit about OUA only 5%. I am responding to feedback from OUA students who didn't like being different from face-to-face -face students, um, and I don't have the capacity to mark all of those discussion board tasks unless you want to do them. So the discussion board tasks are due along the way. If you get them done on time, um, and you submit them, I will give you feedback. Um, but they are not accessible. And then by the time we get to week 14 or thereabouts, there will be an exam. There will be an open book exam. Uh, it will be, uh, you won't be able to take a lot of electronic resources into it. We will spend quite a bit of time in week 12, which is put aside for revision in practicing and looking at the exam structure will be like. Um, the trick to exams is understanding what exams are assessment is to understand what the criteria is. So everything is marked to a rubric. Um, and it's worth actually looking at what the criteria are beforehand. When you go into each of the assessment tasks, the little gif on the screen that shows you how to find them, you will find that there is a rubric that will set out what does a fail look like for this criteria. Well, firstly, what are the criteria? What does a fail look like? What does a pass look like? What does a credit look like? It makes sense for you to read those and to understand what I'm looking for. Because, for example, one of the criteria is that you incorporate referencing formatted as AGLC4. Now, if you format your references in some other way, there may not be an academic integrity issue, but I can't give you marks because you haven't met one of the criteria. Okay, so have a look at the criteria. The other thing that's important to think about with the criteria is at the end of the day, while we don't mark to a curve, this is possibly the first time for many of you that you won't be at the top of the pack. Um, and unfortunately, studying law seems to have a reputation of being competitive sport. Uh, and unfortunately, again, from my point of view, part of the criteria, particularly at the distinction and high distinction level of whether or not you're worthy of that criteria is that your work needs to distinguish itself from the rest of the pack in a way. And so work that may well be distinction and high distinction worthy uh, in a different context is often credit worthy in a JD context. Um, and a credit is not a bad mark, okay? I just need to say that out. Oh, credit's all the way through my degree, um, mostly, not all, but mostly. Um, and, you know, I am a good lawyer. I guess I have yet to prove that to you, but you know, my LinkedIn profile would suggest that. Um, being good at school is different from being a good lawyer. 
Uh, and part of what we are trying to do here, particularly in the JD program, is move from being good at school into being able to ask the right questions and do the right things. So the big difference between a, a master's level degree and an undergraduate degree really goes down to this question of synthesis. Um, and really, to me, the JD is ideal as a, a basis for becoming a lawyer because in practice, the difference between a good lawyer and a bad one isn't what they know but what questions they ask. And particularly in this day and age, access to information, that used to be the big barrier to entry, access to information is its almost gone. Uh, I know you shouldn't, but you will. Google things as you go. There's information is available to everyone. But the information is only the beginning. It's what you do with that information that counts. And here in the JD, you are moving from that, remember what the teacher said and repeat it, into and what used to get you the HD is then have an opinion about it, analyse it, think why is it so. Um, now we're going into the synthesis stage, which is really about how do I make sense of this? How do I apply it in a real context? How do I turn this into something new? Recommended textbooks went on sale today. Sorry, very late. Um, another reason for the way that we're arcing the class. Um, they are available in the uh, library as online texts, and my guess is they'll be on the shelves in reserve. I believe you can find eight of these on each. Uh, they should be available for those of you face to face and want to look at physical text very, very soon. Um, they're eye wateringly expensive. The benefit is you are buying the new that you will use them in advanced contract law as well. If you don't, if you like paper copies, and many people do, and that's the way you want to work. Um, if you were to buy the most previous edition or the edition before that, you will probably be fine. You will also notice in the reading list that I've identified a couple of other texts. So any modern Australian textbook is likely to help you. Um, there are also a number of databases like uh, Halls Resource Laws of Australia or the Laws of Australia, which topic by topic will look at similar topics to what we're doing. They might not call them exactly the same thing, but they'll identify the cases, etc. So there are other ways of finding this. Um, the big negative to only working electronically is you cannot take electronic things into the exam. But reading the textbook in the exam is it's really not a good look. It's, if you're particularly if you're reading it for the first time, um, <laughs> The index is kind of handy, you know, you can kind of look and see if something you're thinking about is covered. Um, but, again, you can print out bits, you make your own notes. There are other ways of getting there. Now, you know, I think Jenny Patterson and Andrew Robinson are amazing. They've done a great job. This is a very accessible textbook, but particularly about chapters one and two. I think it just puts you off what is actually a really interesting subject, and that's why I recommend uh, the alternative one, um, the Lears. Uh, off the top of my head, but um, I think it's a better chapter to start with for the intro. But the rest of it, it's accessible, it's easy to read. Um, my own approach that's always worked for me is I need to read the textbook first, then I know why I'm looking at the cases. Um, other people feel better reading the cases first and then delving in that way, work with what suits you. Um, yeah, so earlier cases are fine. The other piece of information that is probably important to you, you can access it from the syllabus page, is what we call the Part B. The Part B is effectively your contract from the university that sets out how we're going to work and what you're going to do. Um, but basically what's important there is that the topics basically work in this kind of pattern. Um, I'm saying today the intro part of how I'm going to run the class I'm just doing today We'll talk about what a contract is and what it means when we get together on the 14th. Uh, and then we'll continue on in looking at what an agreement is in topic two that same day. We'll look particularly at the upfront part of an agreement. And then we'll talk about acceptance on the Monday night. 
and your first assignment will really focus on copies one, two, and three. It may have other things in it. You may need to read ahead. I'm not going to promise you that because in the real world, our clients really say, oh, I'll come to you with that problem next week because I know you haven't read out it yet. Um, so I can't promise that you won't actually have to do your own research. Like, you know, this is the world we live in. Uh, but the focus of it will be on what we cover in those first three, six topics. Uh, then we kind of we move through uh, the elements of contract. So, you know, spoiler alert, to not to give too much away, in order to have a contract, we need to have agreement, which is generally made up of an offer and acceptance, but there are other ways to write it as well. We will have this thing called consideration. For the time being, think of that as price. Something gets paid for the promises that are made. Uh, we have um, an intention. So the parties have an intention to enter into a legal relationship. And we have, what else do we have? We have a complete senior moment. I shouldn't have said that out loud. I should have just kept talking and then it would be there now. I'm embarrassed and so it's on. Offer, offer and acceptance, intention, consideration, and it's just gone. It's gone. Certainty. Oh, my God, and I'm being recorded. It'll be there in a second. You'll have the four elements. You'll know what they are, and you'll yell them at me. You will know them off by heart, and every time I forget that one, you will be able to humiliate you publicly. I'm going the colour of my glasses. That's ridiculous. Um, anyway, just having a moment. It'll come. Uh, so, so once we've worked out what a contract is, we will then look at initiating elements that might affect whether or not that contract can be enforced. So, for example, if find it is an intention to have a contract, do the parties have capacity? And so, in other words, do they have the mental capacity or maturity to enter into the contract? Uh, we will also look at privity, who the parties are. And so, in order to enforce an agreement, you need to be a party to it. There are many, many occasions where the person who is supposed to affect it by the contract is, and, and by its breach, is actually not a party to it. So we can get those initiating uh, elements. And then we'll hone into, once we've actually built this contract, we will look at what does the contract say? How do we work out what the terms of the contract are? And we'll do that by looking at the express terms, so things that are written or spoken. We will look at implied terms. So things that are taken for granted or that the law says must be included in some way. And we will really then round that out, that reading of the contract, by looking at disclaimers and particular types of terms so that you've got an idea about formation as we go. Um, some helpful things. I'm sorry. If you don't like reading, this is not the degree for you. You need to read. Read some more, and then there'll be some extra reading for you to do after that. Um, like I said at the beginning, most weeks there's a desk lecture where I'm going to explain some of the readings. Uh, I will present the lecture, but they're more likely to be a seminar. Most weeks I will start the seminar with some kind of quiz or game to test where we're up to. That helps me work out where what most people are understanding or not understanding so that I can wrap my head around that and focus the discussion in the class on the stuff where we need to do the most work. Um, always a good idea as soon as possible after class, whether that's participating in class or listening to a lecture, to really go back and consolidate your notes. What questions do I have beforehand have they been answered? What questions do I have now that I didn't have before? What do I need to read more closely? Why? Even answering questions of why did we read that? Now, I won't talk about every every contract that we read in class. doesn't mean it won't be in the exam or won't be relevant to a task in some way. Um, I won't talk about everything. I'll try and curate it together in a way that's manageable, but you're still going to have to look at the bigger picture. Um, great thing to do is to see if you can explain what you learned to somebody else. Again, teaching others, the act of actually explaining in plain language to somebody who doesn't have a legal background, something new, something that you've learned really helps with your understanding both of what you've learned but also where your gaps are. Uh, so it's a, 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 an exercise I suggest many people do often as possible. Uh, 
reflecting on your experience, does what you've learned change the way that you do anything? Think about it, you know, because you will be dealing with contracts every day in one way or another. So think about what you've learned, how it's embedded in what you do. Get involved in discussions in Canvas. Be alert, but not alarmed. See what you recognise in the wild. Look out for contracts. Look out for the way that people put deals together. Watch the news and just keep asking why. Another thing that's good for you to think about this early stage, again, I'm assuming that most of you are in your first year, many of you are at the very, very beginning. Uh, think about the tools that you're going to use for your resources. EndNote, uh, it's an investment, um, but it is available as a free resource to all students. There's a particular library that you need to upload for, um, for AGLC4, but keeping a kind of database of all of the cases that you read and working out how to use them and cite them properly <coughs> can save you a lot of time at the 11th hour down the track. And any, whether it's in no, whether it's a fancy system like that or just a bullet journal, get yourself some sort of system for keeping track of what you've done, what you need to do, and why it matters. I'm also a big fan of Evernote, which is a free program that many of you might have come across. It's really good for just clipping things organising things, you can search across it. Um, OneNote in Microsoft does similar things. Um, I'm probably more used to Evernote because I've been using it longer, but many people get really great results out of that. Um, by the way, the whole Microsoft suite of products is available to you for free as an RMIT student, so you don't have to spend money on new software or anything like that. Have a look at what's available to you, download it if you need to, and use it. Um, and that is basically all I really want to talk about because we'll get into a real topic um, when we meet on the 14th. And surprisingly, I'm six minutes shy of the hour, I promise. But that's largely because none of you have asked any questions. So, do I have any questions, concerns, frustrations, compliments, interpretive dance, funny hats? Um, Hi, Kat. It's Carla here, a.k.a. Maria. I'm not too sure if you remember um, my I email do. from... I did send an, uh, a note um, that one of the readings actually takes you to the library where you can actually borrow the book. It's the um, Carter's, yep. um, the Carter's book. Um, so, yes, I couldn't actually read that reading. Um, I'm still oh, waiting for the library. No worries. Could you, could you do me a favour, Carla, or anybody else who's in there, if you can go to the reading list and just on that note, can you just put, like, there's, there's an opportunity for comment, could you just say that you can't access it um, and then we'll have a look. Actually, but that does remind me what I was going to do is actually show you guys the reading lists are very new. Um, I used them for the first time over summer when I taught uh, mergers and acquisition, um, and I'm yeah, I'm not sure that many teachers are using it yet. I am completely in love with it. Huge investment for the teacher, so you should say thank you to anybody who's using them. But once we've got them, it should be so so. Simple. It is really great having them in the one place. Yeah, well, it's. Let me just share it. I'll just show you what it looks like. I'm just going to find what it looks like. Okay. I also like that you can tick what you've already read. <laughs> yeah. And oh, those of us who like ticking off a list, how cool is that? Um, so, so you're seeing this from the teacher's point of view, um, but basically it doesn't look terribly different. It looks a little bit different. You'll see that, sorry, I'm assuming you can see my shared screen here, is um, this is where you go to the reading list. Um, the first time you go into it, it will probably give you some tips and tricks about using the reading list that you just have to kind of click through. Um, but, oh, for some reason, two of them are attached to you, doesn't matter. But your reading list will look something like this. I've gone into the online class. It looks very similar to face-to-face -face class. But you'll basically see there are these, it works a bit like... Um, the modules in Canvas, you'll see at the top there's those little uh, <coughs> triangles that let you open something up. Basically, it works topic by topic. 
I put the recommended texts at the beginning so that you can access them, and these should be available now. Um, when you click on something, uh, I'm showing you the teacher's version, but it doesn't look terribly different. Um, you'll need to log in the first time if you're not already logged into the library. And um, by the way, that looked like I logged in super fast. I'm a big fan of a product called LastPass. If you need something to keep your uh, passwords in because you can have good secure passwords and different ones for everything. Um, and this is the book. Where possible, what I've tried to do in the topics is link to the chapter that you need to read. So the way I see it, you guys are short on time. So I'm doing everything I can. In a choice between you looking for something and reading it, I would rather you read, read it. So you'll see here, oh, we're in week three. Um, hopefully this will take us straight to the relevant chapter of the book. And, of course, it doesn't. In that way, it takes you straight there. Now you can see where to the what the relevant reading is so in fact week three we're doing the second half of the chapter that's what it's going to where it has and we're starting with acceptance in week three or topic three um you can see here that you can create a pdf you can download a chapter uh but it's limited so there's a maximum number of pages you could take out of any book um but the other thing that you're able to do um, once you've borrowed the book is highlight and do the other things that you might do. So, you know, think of the trees. Think of the trees. Um, so there's one somewhere, presumably in topic one, Carla, that didn't work. Yep, the one by Carter. Carter, Carter, Carter. I think it's the first one. Oh, there it is. Oh, uh, the library haven't released it yet. Yes, yes. The library haven't. So I'm just, sorry, that's just showing me the library haven't released it yet. So that will be released as soon as they do the copyright clearance. Uh, Again, okay. I, I really appreciate your patience with these things. It's just, this is completely new. Um, if you'd done this subject last semester, you had to look for that yourself. So, um, you know, which you can still do, by the way. But, um, so, you know, there's nothing to stop you, by the way, if this is broken from just going into the library and producing your resources. So you have the name of the book. You have the name yeah, I've requested for a copy. They don't have a digital copy available online. So, um, yeah, the library will provide me a copy. Uh, I'm, I'll scan my chapter and give it to you. It's good. It's useful. Um, okay, cool. Um, so the reading list is good. And as you read things, you can tick them off and feel like a hero. Uh, you can also, oh, look, and the chances are that's you there. There you go, Carla. You've Absolutely, made yes. So one of the things that's clearly not working yet is I'm not getting the emails when that comes through yet. So, again, bear with us as we work out the new tech. Um, it'll be worth it. Any other questions, concerns, frustrations, compliments? I came away right on 6.30, so I will make a recording of what well, I've made a recording of what we're doing. And I will um, share that with the rest of you. Those of you who can see your faces, uh, hopefully I'll recognise you when I see you in person. Um, I think the person who came from the furthest away is Sierra, um, off in southwestern Western Australia, southeastern Western Australia. Did I get that right? Yes. <laughs> Southwest. Southwest, yes. Uh, so, but if there's somebody else who's, you know, asleep in the UK somewhere, please let us know. Um, I'm, I love teaching this subject. I love working with you guys. So I'm really set for having a great semester. Uh, I hope you are too. And I'll look forward to getting us started on the 14th. Take care. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Dad. See you guys. Thank you. Yeah.